Hi, my name is Juliette Selgren, and this is my podcast, The Great Antidote. This podcast has been brought to you by the Center for Growth and Opportunity at Utah State University. To learn more, visit www.thecgo.org. Hi, today it is my pleasure to talk to Shika Dalmio. Shika is a columnist at The Week and other places. She's a tireless advocate for immigration reform. And today I want us to talk about an issue that is somewhat related to immigration, if only indirectly, and that's the rise of nationalism, specifically right-wing nationalism in the United States. Welcome. Thanks a lot for having me on, Juliet. So before we get started, what is the most important thing that people my age or in my generation should know that we don't? That's a very hard question uh, because, (laughs) uh, you know, it's not, I'm not sure what your generation knows because I'm 500 years old. (laughs) And uh, so I'm not sure what you don't know. But in general, just going by my experience from when I was your age to my age now, um, I think, you know, when we are young, uh, we get taken up with the power of ideas. We understand the world uh, through intellectual discovery. And uh, that can be very exhilarating. Um, you know, that's uh, when we get one idea that helps us make sense of something we've observed or we've seen. Um, you know, we think ideas is all we need to make sense of the world. But, you know, the old cliche that experience matters is actually quite true. But because as you get older, you actually forget a lot of the things that you've learned, or what you first knew. It's amazing to me how much one forgets. And what one starts relying on is kind of like the aggregate of experiences that one has acquired uh, you know, over the years, over uh, as you've grown older. And so my advice is that, you know, it's very exhilarating when uh, one is your age to discover new ideas, and that's great and keep discovering new ideas, but don't get stuck on one idea. Uh, if I have an idea, but use it to engage other ideas, and that will broaden the sum set of experiences that you have, which will come in very handy later in life, do not get, uh, you know, too stereotypical, too ossified in your thinking. Experience, you'll realize, will start to matter more. I don't know if that makes sense, but uh, I think maybe it'll make sense as you get older and you are 500 years old like I am. <laughs> it makes a good amount of sense. I'll definitely try to keep that in mind. That's not something I've been aware of, I guess, because to me right now, ideas is like the bulk of what i used to understand the world. So you're right. Um, Okay. Let's talk about nationalism. I know nationalism is kind of used interchangeably with a lot of different words that are somewhat similar, but have different distinctions within them. Um, So what is your definition of nationalism? Well, uh, the nationalism is uh, sometimes it's an idea and sometimes it's an ideology. Uh, nationalism um, is an ideology. If you understand it as an ideology, it is an ideology which says that there is a fixed identity to a, a collective called the nation. So there is a nation state, there is a country, there is America, there is France, there is India. And each of them have a defining idea that makes them a nation as opposed to other countries that may have some other different idea. So it is uh, a sense of it's an ideology that gives you an identity based on the country that you are living in. I see. And it seems like... Over the past years, nationalism has been rising over the entire world, from Donald Trump to Prime Minister of India Modi and the Turkish President 
Erdogan, I think I'm pronouncing that correctly, um, the success of far-right parties all over Italy, Germany, Austria in 2017, 2018, it seems to be on the rise everywhere. And let's focus primarily on the United States because that's where we are and that's where that's where the focus kind of is. Um, but what is... What, how did American nationalism, what, what was it and how does it differ from nationalism in, let's say, India? Uh, yeah, those are very good and very big questions. So first of all, you know, even though nationalism right now is a right wing phenomenon, as you mentioned, That has not actually historically been the case. Nationalism has been variously over the last 250 years, uh, you know, both been associated with the left and the right. Uh, I think if you look at history, uh, nationalism originally arose um, to push back against uh, colonial domination. And at that time, it was very much an idea of the left, right? because it was really progressive forces that were fighting against uh, colonialism. So at the end of uh, World War I, you saw, um, you know, the Ottoman Empire and the Austro-Hungarian Empire, they kind of collapsed and they uh, led to, you know, a whole set of nationalist movements within Europe. Nationalism was the idea that, gave people uh, the the strength and the sense of an identity that they needed in order to push back against colonialism. I mean, it was a way of saying, you know, we have our own identity, we are a nation, and we don't want to be ruled by foreign nations, by foreign powers. And, uh, and that idea of nationalism, that, you know, we are a nation and we need self-rule, not foreign rule, came to a real head after the Second World War when, uh, um, you know, after the defeat of uh, Nazism and fascism, uh, the British Empire, which actually won, also collapsed. It collapsed uh, very spectacularly in India, which is where I come from. <clears throat> and uh, in India, uh, you've heard of uh, Mahatma Gandhi. He used a certain idea of nationalism to unite the Indian people, give them an identity, Indian identity, to fight back against British colonialism. And it was extremely powerful. And at that point, nationalism was actually a unifying idea. Now, India, you know, in uh, in contrast to many other homogeneous countries, is actually a very, very diverse country. It has many religions. It has many languages. It has even different ethnicities. And he needed a way, Gandhi needed a way to unite all of them under one umbrella to be able to fight British colonial rulers. And that was sort of like, a good sense of nationalism. That was the inclusive sense of nationalism because it was against uh, oppression by foreign rulers, injustice by foreign rulers who were ruling, uh, you know, uh, people uh, whom they were colonizing, not in their interest, not in the interest of the people who were colonized, but in the interest of uh, the colonies, the British colonies uh, whom they were representing. That was a good, powerful, progressive idea of nationalism. What we are seeing now, in fact, is a different kind of nationalism. This is an exclusionary nationalism. This nationalism wants to say, uh, you know, uh, there are Americans and Americans are people who have certain characteristics. and, uh, And we will not include within this nationalism these other people. Now, in different countries, who this other is, is different. Like different countries that are experiencing different forms of uh, right-wing nationalism, the other can be, you know, in the case of India, uh, it is uh, uh, India because it has a lot of Hindu people. Um, and I'm, you know, I'm a, I was born in a Hindu family, even though I'm not a practicing Hindu anymore. But 80% of India is Hindu. And the Prime Minister Modi is a Hindu nationalist. And he says, you can't really be an Indian unless you are a Hindu. So he, his form of nationalism is a Hindu nationalism that wants to turn you know, Muslims and Christians and other religious groups in the country into others, into 
foreign people, even though they lived in India for generations and centuries. In America, the idea is different. Here, it, you know, the nationalism of Donald Trump was him. He was against mainly immigrants, and but uh, some other people do, but mainly immigrants. So his idea was that even though you know, I think if you understand American history, you understand that America is a country of immigrants. And yet he wants to slice and dice Americans into immigrants versus non, uh, non-immigrants or native citizens. And that's where his idea of nationalism comes from, uh, excluding people who seem foreign to him, you know, or to foreign to a lot of Americans. So that's kind of like the basis of the right wing nationalism in America. So when did this trend of not not nationalism in the sense, the inclusionary sense, um, when did that change occur in the United States and why? Yeah, um, that's also a very good question. So, you know, America, unlike, say, many uh, European countries like France or England, uh, it never had... Uh, you know, any uh, identity as such, right? I mean, one has a sense that it means something to be a Frenchman. There is, uh, you know, you speak the French language and you have certain customs, certain way of living, you know, which define you as French. And the British have their own sense of identity. You know, they have a common language. They uh, belong to certain, you know, Anglo-Saxon, you know, they have Anglo-Saxon ancestors. America was never a country like that, right? I mean, America was founded by European settlers who were fleeing religious persecution and oppression in Europe. And um, and then, of course, we America at some one point also had a lot of slaves. Uh, but American founding was based on an idea. It was this based on this idea, you know, which is uh, to me the cornerstone of what we call liberalism or liberal democracy. That um, you know what uh, defines people and what makes people is not that they belong to a certain tribe or speak a certain language, but they adhere to a certain set of ideas. And those ideas are you know individual rights, equality before the law. Uh, justice, that, you know, these principles are what we all agree on and what makes us Americans. That idea, I think, um, has been getting lost in America in the last 30, 40 years. And there are many, you know, there are many theories about what has uh, caused this loss in this, you know, this faith in kind of like this American liberalism, what makes us Americans is, is our commitment to a certain set of ideas and principles of justice. Uh, and now the right over here is in search of an identity. It is search of an artificial identity so to substitute this, uh, you know, loyalty to ideas to this loyalty to some other group identity, whether it is language or whether it is religion or whether it is, you know, something else. And over the last like 30 years, the right has been trying different you know, sources of identity. So at one point, there was, a, there was a huge movement against bilingualism in the United States, and English was supposed to be what made Americans Americans, that we speak, uh, we all speak English. So Hispanics who speak, you know, largely uh, uh, Spanish were kind of considered not part of this identity. Now that has kind of broadened to include all immigrants. So a lot of immigrants actually speak English, like, you know, I speak English, your mother is French, she speaks English, but that's no longer the cornerstone of for the right of being, you know, American. Now they want, uh, I think it's more the action is on certain re- religious identity that if you are, you know, uh, Islam is not a religion that's considered to be compatible with uh, this American identity. Um, you know, I think race uh, plays into if you are not, you know, a white, if you're a person of color, uh, then, you know, you are not part of that uh, American identity. Um, so, you know, so now the rights idea is shifting from ideas to group identity and the, the right is in search of what this group identity ought to be to anchor this new kind of American nationalism. It's very contrary to the whole 
pride of America being this place where anyone can come and anyone can join in. You don't have to speak English. You don't have to follow a certain religion. And that's not enforced by law. And it just seems to go against all of that which we were founded on. That's, yeah, no, that's absolutely right. In some ways, you know, in my view, uh, you, uh, you know, we are talk, going to talk in terms of what's American and what's not American. To me, many immigrants who come to America, you know, just because they are either fleeing some kind of religious persecution and they are looking for a place where they can practice their faith without persecution by the state, or they are just coming here to participate in a market economy and, uh, you know, which provides better uh, economic opportunities. All of them in some ways are buying into American principles much more than, uh, you know, these new right wing nationalists who want to understand Americans not as individuals, but as part of certain groups, whether it is by race or religion or, uh, you know, ethnicity or what have you. But yeah, to me, you know, that's in some ways fundamentally un-American and, uh, you know, all the people whom they are calling un-American are the real Americans. It's interesting to me because this doesn't necessarily follow a trend, but from what I've observed in my own life is that immigrants usually have a bigger respect for things like the Constitution and our history, things which people who were born here and have been here and have had family here for generations usually take for granted. And it's not everyone, but it's more than, I don't know how to explain it. Does that make any sense? Yeah, no, it absolutely makes sense. And actually, if you look at, uh, you know, uh, Pew Research, which does a lot of polls uh, of attitudes about America and trust in American institutions and American values, Interestingly, they always find that immigrants, even from Islamic countries, which, you know, these right wing uh, right wing people will tell you can't be American, they sh- they have much more faith in American institutions. They are you know much more satisfied with their life in America than Americans over here. And I think the reason for that is that because these people have come from places that where they have seen real oppression, right? They have seen real persecution. They've seen real deprivation, economic deprivation. Uh, They have a reference point by which they can compare what America means to them, right? Whereas Americans who've lived here for a long time, just take the, the power of these ideas and, you know, why America works just for granted, And so if you've been an American, you know, whose forefathers go back, you know, seven, eight generations, um, you know, you don't see how America works. You can't see why America doesn't work because you don't quite know how how much worse things really can be. And immigrants who come over here, you know, really from uh, polities that are not functioning polities, they have a reference point. They know why these countries don't work and America works. And so they have like this in, intuitive, instinctive, emotional connection to America in a way that, uh, you know, Americans who've been here a long time don't have. Does that make what? sense? Yeah, yeah, yeah. What kind of policies do conservative nationalists want to see implemented? Yeah, you know, it's they haven't quite figured out like a full program uh, of enforcing a certain kind of nationalism. Mm-hmm. Uh, the first thing is they don't want more immigrants because they're, they're you know, they think immigrants dilute uh, whatever identity it is that they have in their head. Right. I mean, so they look different. They speak in, you know, foreign languages. Uh, they have accented English like I do. And, you know, they think that dilutes like, you know, that prevents a certain kind of American identity, collective identity from cohering. So so the first agenda is to not allow more immigrants to come in. The, and, you know, you pointed out that I write a lot about immigration. And to me, 
you know, America, I don't know if you're familiar with the term, the nation of nations. America, yes. that's what America has been called, the nation of nations. And they don't want that nation of nations. They just want a nation. And so they want other national, they want to stop other nationalities from coming to the United States. That's one part of it. But then they also go further than that. They think that, you know, if America is for Americans, then uh, Americans deserve certain, uh, are entitled to certain kinds of privileges uh, from the state, from the government that other people are not. So if you, you know, Trump, one of the things, one of the policies he initiated was um, buy American, hire American, which meant that if... um, you were going to do business with the federal government. If you wanted contracts from the federal government, then uh, you needed to use American products and you needed to use American labor. So, you know, only citizens of the United States could. So that was one way in which he was trying to uh, promote his nationalistic policies. Then the other part of it is they don't like trade. You know, which is interesting because the right in this country, uh, at least since Reagan, has always been, you know, more favorable to trade than uh, than the Democratic Party. But now that has reversed. Now it is, you know, uh, Republicans who are against trade because trade means globalization and globalization means that Native American workers have to compete with people in other countries and they don't want that. So they attack trade. So that's another way. So, you know, sort of uh, doing business in the country with Americans and not doing business with country, with uh, people outside the country are kind of like two pillars of this kind of nationalism. And Trump's whole buy American, hire American was kind of continued by Biden. And as you mentioned, their resistance to trade mimics that of the left. And so it seems as though they are kind of joining together on this front, not not in words, like no one will say it, but in their policy plans and in the policies that they push, they seem very similar. Uh, in, in some ways, yes. Uh, there is, you know, it's more rhetoric and rhetoric matters, uh, actually. Um, in some ways, that is the case. Um, you know, historically, it is absolutely true that it was the left that was against globalization. You're probably too young to remember this. But about 20, 25 years ago, when, uh, you know, um, uh, the question of trade with China, how much should the United States trade with a country like China was a big issue. Um, it was the left that was opposed to it in many ways. They, The left thought that globalization didn't lead to, uh, you, uh, you know, prosperity in other countries. It felt it led to a race to the bottom as corporations in the West moved their operations overseas and then used, you know, cheap um, child labor or poor working conditions. And they thought trade, therefore, and globalization was bad for these other countries. What the right has done, it is has flipped the script. It's saying globalization is not bad for poor, you know, emerging countries, it's bad for us. So that's kind of like the big difference between, I think, the left attack, left's attack on globalization and the right's attack on trade and globalization. But since they are both against globalization and trade, you know, the two sides are now in some ways, that's my fear, that there'll be kind of like this bipartisan consensus against trade. Uh, immigration is different. I mean, on immigration, I think the right is in a far worse place than the left. I mean, the left used to be in the same place as the right, but the right has now is in a far worse place on immigration than the left. And partly it's because I think the left, as you know, is much more interested in, you know, or cares much more about minorities and poor people and people of color. And so that kind of keeps away some of the native sentiment from recreeping in the left, although, you know, the left used to be pretty nativist in its own right once upon a time. In a piece for Reason from 2020, you note that, quote, A top-down national engineering and anti-immigration project like the one pushed by the new right nationalists will absolutely not unite the country, but instead it will backfire and force Americans, 
paradoxically, to turn their backs on the one true source of their rootedness, the founding principles of equality, individual rights, and human dignity, universal principles that unite them, not just with each other, but with the rest of humanity, end quote. Can you expand on this and kind of explain what you mean when you say that? Yeah, so the point I was trying to make over there was that, um, so the right in this country wants to be exclusionary, like we discussed, and it wants to exclude, you know, mainly immigrants, foreigners from the country, right? And so how do you do that? Um, It wants to have citizenship test, you know, more, there is already a citizenship test. If you're an immigrant and you want to become a naturalized citizen, you have to take a citizenship test. You know, you have to show that uh, you have a certain understanding of American civics. You understand the American form of government and all of that. Uh, Now, uh, the right wants to go further. What the right wants to do is it wants immigrants who come to this country, uh, you know, take something equivalent to a loyalty oath that we are going to be loyal to certain principles of America. And, you know, we can debate, they can debate how they are going to define them. My point in that was, okay, if you're going to have a test for immigrants, there is inevitably going to be political pressure to then judge Americans by that test too, right? So if you don't want immigrants in this country, you know, who are, let's say, uh, against the First Amendment, uh, you are then going to have to use that same test to judge Americans who are against the First Amendment. Now, I'm like a big, big partisan of the First Amendment. I think the First Amendment is a very, very good thing. But there are there is a reasonable discussion to be had about the First uh, First Amendment and people. And, you know, if you're a free country, you are debating and discussing fundamental notions about that country all the time. If this is the case, then, you know, if... Uh, Ironically, to protect the First Amendment, you are going to have to say that a lot of Americans who are not against, uh, who are not for the First Amendment are not Americans. So this kind of principle kind of eats itself up. You know, if you're going to have, uh, if you're going to judge immigrants by a political criteria, that same political criteria will have to be applied eventually to Americans, and you'll end up slicing and di- dicing Americans based on some political criteria. And if you slice and dice Americans, what will happen is that instead of uniting Americans around a single idea, you're going to divide them across like many political criteria because, uh, you know, Liberals will have their own, you know, Democrats will have their own political criteria of what an American ought to be. Conservatives will have their own. Religious people will have their own. Instead of leaving us all alone, we are all going to be judged by various factions. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah, I see. Is that the case anywhere else in the world? Are there places where there has been some sort of grouping policy to exclude a group from a country or something like that and then the it has been turned inward to hurt the people in the country uh, well the most famous example of course is of nazi germany right uh, yeah. that is the i mean that is the epitome of a certain kind of nationalism uh, you know nazism calls itself na- uh, you know national socialism right and it uh, spectacularly turned against the Jews. I mean, that's what you see in history. That uh, there are, I mean, you know, polity, polities turning uh, turning against their own citizens is just about as common as you can imagine historically. Um, having domestic enemies, I mean, that was a feature of communism. Uh, in Stalin's uh, uh, Soviet Union in Russia, um, if you didn't believe in the communist ideology, uh, it didn't matter how long you had lived in Russia, right? You were just an enemy of the country and you were the enemy of the state. And uh, you were sent off to Siberia. Um, in Nazi Germany, uh, Jews and gypsies were famously considered to be enemies of uh, Germany and they were sent to concentration camps. 
uh, in India right now, uh, you mentioned Prime Minister Modi. He is doing everything in his power to make, uh, you know, to turn against uh, 120 million Muslims live in India. He wants now uh, all kinds of state policies to, uh, you know, give fewer benefits and fewer protections to Muslims. And uh, so where that's going to go, we'll see. But uh, there is a, there was before Corona happened, he was building detention camps all over the country to send off Muslims who could not prove uh, that they were Indian citizens. He wants to send them to detention camps. Not quite, you know, in America, it wasn't quite as bad. But as you know, Trump was building detention camps for uh, people from foreign countries, you know, asylum seekers who were coming over here. Um, uh, so, you know, so th- that was more an effort against outsiders. But the same effort that Trump was using against outsiders have been historically used against insiders, you know, many, many, many times. At Reason, Stephanie Slade wrote a piece about nationalism and patriotism, and she quotes Orwell, and the quote reads, Nationalism is not to be confused with patriotism. And then she continues, both words are normally used in so vague a way that any definition is liable to be challenged, but one must draw a distinction between them since two different and even opposing ideas are involved, end quote. So they can be used interchangeably, but what is the distinction between the two? And how does this relate to America? How, like in the context of America, what does it mean? So I think the distinction that uh, Stephanie was trying to draw over there was, um, so there is a good sense of patriotism. You know, uh, being patriotic simply means that you love your country. It doesn't mean that you hate other countries. You know, you just love your country because it's your own country. Uh, Nationalism, on the other hand, always, or at least now, has kind of a more exclusionist uh, or exclusionary can't do it, as we discussed. So nationalism is more about my country is better than your country, whereas patriotism is I just love my country. Now, that's kind of like the distinction that I think Orwell Orwell was making. I actually, you know, uh, but on the other hand, Oscar Wilde, I think it was, who also called patriotism the last refuge of the scoundrel. And, uh, you know, patriotism can be also just another like cheap ideology where, you know, I'm better than you because I love my country more. You know, I'm more patriotic than you. When it becomes a way of morally assessing the citizenry, uh, patriotism can also become a problem. Um, and I think that's kind of like the path we are in in the United States, at least when it comes to certain you know, right-wing ideas. I mean, uh, during the last six years of Trump, it was, you know, uh, I don't know if you, you noticed it or your generation noticed it, but, you know, a lot of us were quite, uh, quite freaked out about this, this idea that, you know, there is a certain way of loving America, that there is a certain kind of love that you have to exhibit towards America. And if you don't love America in this particular way, then you were unpatriotic. Um, That was kind of like a dangerous road to go in. So I think, you know, so in my view, both nationalism and patriotism can be good or bad. It just depends what kind of an idea they are anchored in. A patriotism, you know, that's a capacious patriotism that you know, patriotism that believes in liberal democracy and including everybody in that is a good kind of patriotism. And that kind of nationalism is a good kind of nationalism that's accomplished quite a few things in history. But if patriotism, which says I am better than you because you don't love your country enough and I love my country, you know, I love my country more, that's not a good kind of patriotism. So you mentioned Trump and under him, we kind of saw patriotism being equated with military parades and soldiers in uniform saluting political authorities. This seems to be a departure from how Americans celebrated in the past. In France, um, on French Independence Day, which is the 14th of July, there's a military parade. But in the United States, there's no 
national law that you must like do this or there's usually not any sort of military parade or governmental thing it's communities and neighborhoods doing their own thing celebrating america in their own way so do you think there's a threat of the way we celebrate america being changed into something that is dictated more by the government and by this structure of this is how you will show your love for america and anything else is wrong uh yeah that's a very good question so you know th- this is again another way in which america is different uh, has uh, has been different from many other countries uh because it did not have it did not uh, emerge from monarch from a monarchy right uh all of europe you know all of continental europe and even uh, britain they at one point or another had a monarchy and the monarchy was the state you know was the the pre industrial equal of the state and the state and so you had to love you know to show that you loved uh you know your country you had to love the monarchy and the state and what did the monarchy do in order to uh Uh, you know bring people together it held large festivals right? i mean like in the pomp and circumstance and parades and spectacles and extravaganzas and the whole sort of you know country would come together to kind of like look at this uh, extravaganza and love their king or queen and uh, what, uh, uh, uh and you know this tradition then kind of stayed in most of continental europe where even after the monarchy ended the government or the state became the anchor for loving a country so the state and the nation nation state they became kind of synonymous so if you loved your nation you had to love the state the government of that nation now america was founded on the whole idea of skepticism of government of limited government it was not supposed to be the source of identity for americans americans you know thomas jefferson said uh, in the declaration of india uh, of independence that uh, you know americans should be engaged in the pursuit of life liberty uh, i'm sorry um, life liberty in the pursuit of happiness that's what america is about that's what the government has to guarantee americans uh so the government is not an end in itself the government is a means for people to find their own you know their own individual projects of happiness so the, he, there was never any accommodation in america for americans to start you know coming together and loving the state the government so the 4th of july no tradition of uh military parades uh you know this sort of uh expression of state power that is not what america has been about that's kind of what trump wanted to start he wanted to borrow from the french who have these kinds of parades to remind french of their you know allegiance to the state uh he wanted to do that in america he wanted in 4th of july for the first time i think in this country's history uh you know there was uh, he gave this big big national address uh, um, you know I, i think it was outside the lincoln memorial and he had military drills by uh, the air force uh, conducted in the air that's all very very alien to american sensibilities america celebrates uh, american celebrate fourth fourth of july by very spontaneous means you know you have neighborhood parties over here there is no government program there is no government policy that requires you to do anything like that every city in america every neighborhood in america will have their own way of having their own 4th of July they'll have fireworks they'll have barbecues they'll have all kinds of things but none of it is or- orchestrated or planned by the state that's kind of what trump was trying to kind of reverse make state the sort of the you know the governing principle of america and that's very alien to american sensibilities the left isn't immune to nationalism traditionally that was kind of the side of politics where we would see more nationalism evidently in the policies presented but you and your husband Arthur Melzer recently wrote a piece that I found super important about why fighting against the rise of nationalism was or is important and significant so can you kind of 
talk to us about that a little bit. What, why is it so important? Yeah. Uh, so, uh, you know, that piece that you allude to, uh, that was tracing the history of uh, uh, Weimar Germany and uh, how Hitler came to power and examining some of the parallels in our, you know, in the current state of the right in America. And in that piece, what we were saying was that if you looked at Weimar, which was at that point a liberal democracy, you know, it had elections and there was even a sort of a constitution for very briefly, uh, you know, which uh, was supposed to guide how the government ruled. Um, and all of that came to an end because this virulent form of nationalism that Hitler uh, you know, came up with, became very appealing. And this nationalism in some ways was similar to the kind of, I mean, and I don't want to make any parallels between our current situation and, you know, what happened then. Uh, very different situations. However, the one thing that the two had was they wanted to return their country, you know, to some former mythical state of glory. So make America great again. That suggests that America is not great now, right? It was great at some point in the past, and we have to return to that point in the past. And that is kind of what happened in Weimar too, that, uh, you know, um, uh, Hitler and Nazism wanted to return Germany to its glorious roots, you know, when it was a major power in Europe. Uh, World War World War One was a very humiliating chapter for Germany because uh, Germany lost and it had to pay all kinds of like reparations to, you know, the other powers around it. And it was very humiliating. And he wanted to restore Germany's honor. And that was like a very, very powerful principle. But it was also a very uh, reactionary and regressive principle because that meant um you know, returning to a time which was actually not a very good time, right? I mean, America shouldn't be returned to some former state of glory because there was no former state of glory. America has a terrible history with slavery and Jim Crow and discrimination and segregation and, you know, and what have you. And we shouldn't be wanting to return to some mythical state of glory. So that's kind of like the sense in which, you know, the you know, the, the, that kind of nationalism which wants uh, to uh, undo the progress that has been made, moral progress for equality and justice and individual rights, and go back to some former principle of glory. That kind of nationalism is very dangerous and needs to be fought. Thank you. Um, okay, so to wrap up, what is one thing that you believed at one time in your life that you later changed your position on and why? So, um, you know, when I was young, uh, you know, young people, it's weird. They can be both very idealistic and they can also be both very cynical. And when I was young, I was both. I was both idealistic and I was also cynical because I just thought, you know, uh, the world just can't live up to my ideals, right? I mean, the world is just kind of like this dumb you know, unjust, exploitative place. Um, and one thing I was super cynical was about, uh, you know, people who went into public service or government. Uh, you know, I just thought, and I grew up in India, in socialistic India, right, where the government was terrible and uh, only, you know, very corrupt people. I mean, it was just, you know, synonymous with corruption. And I just felt like, you know, if you go into government, you're doing something just bad I've actually changed and so it didn't matter to me whether good people went into government or bad people went into government they were if you you know they were just bad now I've actually kind of come to disagree with it and I I, I think it is important for good people to go into public service because it matters uh, it matters because if it's corrupt people who are you know just giving into all the you know, corruptive effect of power, then it'll erode the trust in public institutions that people have. And that is extremely dangerous. So I've come to believe that, 
you know, it's important for good, decent, honest people to go into government, even though the results that are going to be achieved are not always great. But the fact that they are trying to do something honestly does actually matter. So I'm not quite so cynical about good people going into government anymore. I'm I'm pretty cynical about that. Maybe I need to rethink things a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> Thank I, yeah, you. I I would have agreed with you when I was not when when I was twenty years old. Well, thank you so much for being on the podcast. I had such a good time and I learned so much. So thank you. Thank you. This was very, very interesting and uh, stimulating discussion, Juliet. Great questions. Thank you. Well, that's all we have time for today. I'd like to thank my guest once again for their time and insight. I would also like to thank everyone who listens, subscribes, and shares the Great Antidote podcast. If you would like to be on the podcast or if you have a guest in mind, please feel free to reach out to me at the great antidote at the cgo.org. Bye.